we talked about the three kind of user loops, counting loops, user query, when you ask the user, do you wish to continue, or a sentinel value, you know, enter score or negative one to quit, something like that. Or choose, make your menu choice and, or press Q to quit, that kind of thing. That's a sentinel value. So is our bowling score algorithm robust? Well, I skipped this example, but if we were going to do a bowling score tally program, I don't know how many turns you get in bowling. Apparently an infinite number of turns. This program does not have a limited number of rounds to bowl. Come on, somebody has been bowling and can tell me how many? There's 10 frames. 10 frames? Okay, yeah. So if, if we were going to write this loop, we would probably not just go until they hit negative one to quit. We would probably ask them frame one, frame two, frame three, frame four, all the way up to 10. So, something to note about the way that this program is written is that they create a variable called total score. And inside the while loop, every time somebody types in a score, they add it to the total. And then they ask for the next score and get it in. And if that score is not equal to negative one, it loops again, otherwise it quits. Well, what would happen if they didn't enter any scores at all? Enter bowling score negative one to quit. While score is not equal to negative one, it will not enter that body if score is equal to negative one. Then it'll get down here and total score will be zero, count will be zero, and it'll blow up, right? Divide by zero error. Or if not a divide by zero error, it will still display something that the user would not want to see. might be interesting to modify that, but I'm wanting to, to press onward. So a nested loop, a nested loop is a loop that's inside another loop, just like nested if statements. A nested loop could look something like this. Say we want to write a program that's going to look like this. One plus one equals two. One plus two is equal to four. One plus three is equal, what? Yeah. 1 plus 3 is equal to 4. And then 2 plus 1, can I type, is equal to 3. 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. 3 plus 1 is equal to 4. 3 plus 2, yeah, we know where this is going. Like that. So we see here two loop variables. I'm going to call them x and y we see that, it, that y gets iterated from 1 to 3 before x is increased. And then it gets, goes from 1 to 3 again before x is increased. Then it goes from 1 to 3 again, and we're done. So this is an example of the results of a nested loop. There's going to be an outer loop where we are, our loop control variable is x. In the inner loop, our loop control variable is y. So what I would do is I would create two variables before we started. I would set them equal to both equal to one. Then I would have an outer loop while x is less than or equal to three. Then I would have an inner loop nested within it while x is less than or equal to three. And I've already uh, regretted a decision I made that should be y which is that this one, its initialization should be inside the while loop. We could even move its declaration inside the while loop. So I could put that there, take that out there. And then inside here, I would print out this statement here. System.out.println x plus and then a plus symbol. I'm going to write the word plus. Plus y. Yeah. Equals. I should do it with a formatted print statement. Printf percent d, which is for ints, 
plus percent D equals percent D backslash N end quote comma X comma Y X plus Y like that. Inside our inner loop we need to increment the value of Y. You could also use Y plus equals one if you're a fan of the uh, Python syntax. And here we would increment the outer loop variable like that. And so this loop assuming that I haven't made any egregious errors, which I may have, would print this output. Note that Y goes through its entire cycle of 1, 2, and 3 before X ever changes. And that's what we're seeing here. Y goes from 1, 2, and 3. And then when Y is done, it leaves the loop. X is incremented. This condition is checked again. And then it repeats the loop if that condition is still true. So that's a nested loop example. The inner loop completes all iterations before the outer loop iterates once. classical example of that is printing a multiplication chart. An easier example of that, and I may have it assigned as homework, so I'm not going to give it to you yet, is something like this, where you ask a user to print out a rectangle, and they say, I want 10 columns, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, by three rows, like that. And if you were going to do that, you'd need you ask the user how many rows. You ask them how many columns. Say they typed in 10 columns and they wanted three rows. Which would be our outer loop control variable? The number of rows and the number of columns. Uh, rows would be outer, exactly. Why? Because you would want to print out every column before you went to the next row. So your inner loop control variable would be column, and your outer loop control variable would be row. And if that's not a homework assignment, I'm going to make one. I'm going to tack that onto our existing homework assignment. I'm pretty sure that that comes up, though. I'm going to leave that out. I mean, we haven't even hit the chapter, chapter on loops. We're still talking about pseudocode, according to this book. We are done with this chapter. There was, that was the last topic. Chapter 2, quizzes. And a flow chart. Yeah, we don't care. There are three basic forms of the if statement, which is not one of these forms. These quizzes are moronic. If else. Have we heard of if else's? Yeah. If by itself. What the what? If not, yeah, you could have an if not statement. Not per se, not really in Java. You can't do if not, but you can write this. You know. And then if condition is true, then not condition would be the opposite. And if condition is false, then not condition would be the opposite. So anyways, you can have an if not, but you, that one makes no sense. Is it possible for a while loop to have zero iterations? And that's a good question. Could you have a while loop that would not ever execute inside, where the body of the loop would not be executed? No. Well, it's a yes-no question, and I'm going to wait for the second answer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that makes it easy. But when could you have a loop that had zero iterations? What if you had this? Yeah, i wait. I thought I heard it. If you've initialized a value to, like, zero, and the while is saying, yeah, something like that. So if you had y is equal to 0, and then you had while y not equal to 0, right? Or, or I mean, yeah, like that, right? You know, <laughs> that's not going to do anything. Not going to do anything because it cannot enter, just like an if statement. And yeah, you could have, uh, yeah, that would be the absolute shortest one. If this is an infinite loop, or if that's an infinite loop, this would be kind of a, uh, 
Yeah, what's the opposite? An infinitesimal loop <laughs> would not do anything in there because the condition is false. Good point. All righty. Onward and upward. I want the next chapter. I think I uploaded a bunch of quizzes, and I think that I want to make the, well, hmm. it says that somebody's done one, but I don't see it. Ah, uh, binary hex. Okay, all right. Glad I had those. Sure, no problem. Right, right. It was, I mean, we did it in class, but if you did it again, that's totally cool. Eh, nah. <laughs> she tried, though. She tried to get your point. As always, I recommend actually downloading the PowerPoint rather than just viewing it in the preview. All right. Now we're back where we should have started. I should skip chapter two from now on, but nah. First Java program, comments, class name, source code file name. I would like for everybody in here to run TextPad. And we're gonna write code inside of TextPad rather than NetBeans, just to see if I remember the syntax. So I went to the start, inside of search programs, I typed in TextPad. I ran TextPad. Let's create a file, class test, parentheses, in parentheses. And I'm sorry that my text is so tiny. Let's see if I can. Uh... Where? Why do I? Mm -mm. Fonts. All right. And it didn't save it because... Okay, anyways. Save as. Save it to your favorite directory. Call it test.java. The file name has to match the class name exactly. If you gave it a different file name other than test, it would not work. All right, so inside our class, we need a method. Public, static, void, main, parentheses. And this is kind of a lot of boilerplate that we would have to have in every program that we ran. String args, variable name could be anything, parentheses in parentheses, excuse me, square braces, followed by an in parentheses. And then a curly brace, system.out.println, hello, end quote, in parentheses, semicolon. When I'm ready to run it, I'm going to go to tools, external tools, compile Java. And if I made any syntax errors, it'll show up down here. Now this time it says, tool completed successfully. May not for you. If it does not say tool completed successfully when you hit tools, external tools, then we need to fix it. Anybody who was typing along got a syntax error. Are we all good? All right.
save as and save it as .java. P test .java. Good. And the way you run it is after you've built it, you go to tools, external tools, run Java application. And it says, hello, press any key to continue. Kind of neat. I like the great big window rather than the itty bitty one that that means, did you? <laughs> okay, pardon me, I'm sorry. Tools, external tools. You know, I got my hearing tested on Friday, and they <laughs> wouldn't give me a hearing aid. I'm going to have to deafen myself further to get one. Okay. So, things to note about this. One, this has to match the file name. Another is that every program we write has a main method, regardless of whether we see it or not. When we write one using the form designer, we may not see the main method, but it's still there. Another is that the syntax of this main method has to match this exactly. If you've taken C++, you may be used to the idea that that's supposed to be int, or it can be int. Well, we can't run a Java program directly from the operating system, and so it cannot return a value directly back to the operating system. And so there's no reason to define our function as being able to return a value. And so, in fact, Java forbids it because otherwise it would imply that it could pass that value back to the... It needs to be called that. In C++, you could leave this part out. It was optional. In this language, it is not. What is this? This is supposed to pick up the command line arguments. So that if I ran it from the command prompt, test, you know, no, not going to work. It would not run that way. I might be able to run it by hand. Go to a command prompt, if you can. Go to uh, search programs and files, type in CMD, and type the word Java and hit enter and see if you get a message or if you just get file not found. Who gets a file not found? Is it working for everybody? Do they finally have it configured correctly? Working for everybody? So if you type Java and hit enter, it actually displays some stuff? Okay, cool. If we type Java C, that would invoke the compiler. Oh, and what do you know? There it says is not recognized. So no, it's still not configured correctly. If we typed in path and hit enter, we would see the search path. And if we had rights to change this stuff, we would go and find what directory Java C is stored in and add it to the path then we would be able to invoke these things from the command prompt. If we were going to compile our program from the command prompt, we would have to go into the directory in which it's in. And since Java C doesn't work, I'm not going to bother. And then I would type Java C followed by the file name, like that. And I would hit enter, and if it successfully worked, it would build a file called test.obj. No, Java dot class. Let me give that a shot. All right, so I'm going to go to the desktop, and I'm going to, where did I save my program at? Let's see here, desktop Java, okay, CD Java. So in here, I see my files. I should be able to do Java C test.java, and it would make a java.class file. I said java.obj, but that's C++. Now, when I had my .class file, I would be able to execute it by typing Java followed by the name of the class, but not putting the executable name. But when I compiled it, I don't see the .class file. Where did it put the class file? Oh, there's my class. So, Java C produces file, test.class, and then when I'm ready to run it, 
If you go into the directory where you created your Java file, you should find a test.class file, and you can execute that by giving the name Java space test. And in this case, you don't follow it dot class. And that runs it from the command prompt, like that. It says hello. Now, we're going to do all that? No. If we were old school and insisting on doing everything inside a notepad or whatever, yeah, we would. But the machines are not configured with the compiler in the search path, so we're saved from me making y'all do it all by hand. But if you want to, and when you install Java at home, it will be configured that way. You could, uh, you could compile and run your applications from the command prompt. Now, when you type Java space test, if this is an executable, you should be able to go test and have it run. But it's not an executable. It's just a file. We have to load up something that will run that file. Just like you have to have a web browser to view HTML, or you have to have Word or, or WordPad in order to read a doc. Yeah, I know there are other viewers as well. This is the application that runs that file. There's an application called Java, and it runs that file called test. Now, the Java application provides something called the uh, Java Virtual Machine, Java JVM. What a virtual machine is, is I don't know if, uh, I bet some of y'all have played with video game emulation so that you could run Nintendo or Sega games or arcade games or Sony games or whatever on your computer. Why do you have to have that? Because those games were not programmed to run on Windows, right? Space Invaders and Pac-Man were not written to run on Windows. Instead, they're written in some kind of binary language that runs on a very specific chipset. So the video game emulator is written so that it can understand that program and fake it. It can do everything that the chip was supposed to be able to do, that the collection of chips is supposed to be able to do in order to display the game. And that emulator, once you write it, you could rewrite it. You can write a Mac version of that emulator, and then you'd be able to play Pac-Man on your Mac. The code inside the emulator be completely different just because different operating systems require different kind of code. Then you could write that for your iPhone, and then you could write that for your uh, for Android, and then you could write it in JavaScript so that you could play the games online. Online Pac-Man. All right, so that's not a really a good example. Online Pac-Man emulation. Pac-Man, play your favorite arcade games online. Now somebody has written an emulator that runs in JavaScript, which is absolutely insane if you know what JavaScript is. But this is, a per this is just running the binary code that Pac-Man has written in, the machine language code that Pac-Man has written in. And so we could actually play it in a little bit of window. And you could take that same code and run it on an emulator on any other system that had an emulator written for it and run it on your phone or whatever. So Java works like that. What does the emulator have to do? It has to provide a model that that code would run against. It has to provide you know, the equivalent, the chipset that that code is supposed to work on. Uh, on an old Atari, it would be a, a 6502, and I think that's what the Nintendo is as well, and, and all the graphics chips. And it runs and it provides the framework in which that binary code would run. And the reason you, okay, and so what Java does is it provides a virtual machine and emulator as well. And the reason they wrote it that way is because if you don't have an emulator like that, then when you write source code, it just runs on one platform. If you write C++ code, you have to write different C++ code, or it has to be compiled differently in order to run on a Mac. It has to be compiled differently to run you know, on Android or on your phone or something like that. And the underlying machine language code is completely different for all of those. But if you can provide an emulator, if you can provide a virtual machine, then you can give the same source code, and it'll run, and the source code doesn't know anything about the emulator, right? The source code to Pac-Man was written in like 1980, and they had no idea that people would be writing emulators. It has no idea that it's running in a window. Well, our Java file, that java.class file, has no idea of what it's running in. And so it doesn't care if it's running on a microwave oven or a, or, a, or a phone or, you know, something that sits on the top of your TV or whatever. The reason you do that is for cross-platform compatibility. You write the code once, and then you can run it on any platform that supports Java. Whereas normally, 
where I say normally. The old model was is you wrote source code and you compiled it for a specific platform and it would run on that specific platform. Wow, that was a lot of lecture for me just hitting the first slide of, the, of page three. Our first Java program. Well, we have done that. Here it is. Come back. Print the hello message. We see all the components here, but they added some comments. There's a comment. I like single line comments. Here, he did a double line comment. The double line comment, or not a multi line comment. A multi line comment begins with a slash and a star and ends in a star and a slash. And whatever you put in, the, in between those gets ignored. And in this case, the fact that he used a whole bunch of asterisks to make it look pretty, that doesn't matter. You know, could have used anything, could have left those out, could have used question marks, smiley faces, whatever. So you use comments to document what the code is supposed to be doing. And I know we've talked about that in the past. So, commented text is ignored by the compiler. Style requirement. Include a prologue section at the top of every program you write. We should say at the top of every class, because we can write a program that has more than one class in it. A class, each class is contained in its own file. We will get to the point where we're doing that. So he wants us, if he was our instructor, to include a, as a prologue a line of asterisks a file name, a programmer's name, a blank line, a program description, another line of asterisks, and a blank line. So he's a very particular instructor, Mr. John Dean here. That's what his prologue block would look like. And it's not a bad idea, but meh. So all Java programs must be enclosed in a class. Unlike C++, unlike Python, where you could at least in C++, you had to put everything inside of a main function. But in Python, you could just start writing off code, and, and it would run you know, regardless of what it was encapsulated in. So the class is the name of the program. The main class is the name of the program. Our program is called test because that is the name of the main class. How do we specify that it's the name of the main class? We don't. But when the program is run, and we run, we run, we run Java space test. Test is the main class, just because we specified it. Now when NetBeans runs, how does it know what the main class is? It's, spe it's specified over in the configuration for the project. So when NetBeans is up and loaded, I'll show you that. So program proper style dictates that class names begin with an uppercase letter. Now are the Java police going to come and beat you up if you don't make your classes begin with an uppercase letter. No, but other programmers will look at you like you're like, like you're dumb. Go ahead and always make all your classes begin with an uppercase letter. And then make all your methods, your functions, and your variable names begin with a lowercase letter. And that just makes it really easy to distinguish when you're looking at the code. It's called a coding convention. It's not a requirement. But it's a convention, and it's a convention that uh, was settled upon by the inventors of the Java language, and so it was included in all the requirements, in all the examples. And so everybody who learned Java learned from those examples, and it just became something that everybody picked up. But would it work? If we had called this test, that would work, yeah. If we had called this main, would it work? No, it would not work, because unlike the name of the class, this syntax is fixed. We have to have that in every Java program we write, or it has to be provided for us by the framework. Case is important. Changing that back to lowercase test. Since Java is case sensitive, the file name should start with an uppercase letter. Now honestly, Windows is slack enough that if you make, if you save this file with a lowercase j, and then you tell it to compile it, it'll still work. I believe that to be true. So case sensitive means that the Java compiler does distinguish between lower and uppercase letters. We will always use public class prior to your class name. What does public mean? It means it's accessible outside of your class. If we made this private, if we added, the, if we changed that word public to private, then when we tried to run it, we would get an error. 
Now I left out the word public. I'm going to put private and run it just to kind of prove the point. And it comp no, it didn't even compile. Good for it. Modifier private not allowed here. Well, that's interesting. I'm going to leave that alone and not worry about it right now. If we add the word public there, it means that it's accessible to uh, everything outside of the class. When you leave out the word public, it assumes a default that is very close to public, but not actually. It's a different one called package, package level, and it means that everything in the same package could invoke it. And apparently that's enough to let Java actually, you know, the Java virtual machine invoke it. So from now on, when I type this example in, I'm going to remember to add the word public there. And I want you to remember that as well. Now you can put more than one class in the same file. Not that we're talking about classes yet. But if I had wanted to create another class here, I'm just going to make a class and I'm going to call it A, and I'm not going to put anything in it. If I want to put more than one class in the same file, which is poor programming practice, but I may demonstrate it easy um, anyways, just because it's easy to have everything in one file, you can only have one public class. The rest of them had better not be public. So to get this to work, I would make that private, and that should compile adequately. Now, I'm not going to... Whoop, 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 whoop. Is that so? Okay, leaving off the word private, got it to work. So, let's go from there. Public static void main. When the program starts, the computer, that's wrong, the Java runtime engine, the virtual machine, looks for the main method and begins execution with the first statement after the main method heading. Braces. We use braces to group things together. He thinks, and I kind of agree, that the opening brace should be on a line by itself, but I'm not going to yell at you. If you put your braces in some other fashion, and we've talked about that in the past. So beginning programmers have a tendency to use names like X, Y, and num just like your professor. These are bad variable names. However, if the problem description says to read in a number and the number doesn't represent anything special, then x or num is okay. Now the reason I use single letter variable names is because it's easier for y'all to type. So you see the naming conventions section in appendix five of the book. We're gonna skip naming conventions for now. No, we're not. Here's one naming convention. Do everything in lowercase, but if there are extra words in the variables, you capitalize the second word and the third word and the fourth word and so on. For example, days in month. That's known as camel case because it's got the bumps in it. Class names, you want to go ahead and capitalize the first letter in it as well. Just because we said, as a matter of course, make all your class names begin with an uppercase letter. Now, they want us to not use underscores. I like underscores. I'm going to ignore that. I love this. Whoever wrote this is so bossy. He's not grading my class, but he says that we will lose style points on our homework. Well, I'm not going to make you lose style points if you don't follow these exact rules. Names must be descriptive. N equals Jeff is not descriptive. First name is descriptive. So when you're assigning a variable, you use a single equal statement. When you're comparing, you use double equals. You're probably familiar with that syntax. That's the same um, in JavaScript and Python. You probably have already seen that syntax. Plus sign can either mean addition or it can mean concatenation. When we're building a string, it means concatenation, which means perform this calculation, turn it into text, and append it to the end of this text.
So initialization statements. You give a type, you give a variable name. Don't know why that happened. And then you give it a value. You don't have to initialize all your variables as you create them. In fact, NetBeans is very picky about it, and if you give it an initialization value, which you later do not use, it gives you a warning to that effect, like you did something wrong. So if later on you assign a value for total score, like with a scanner, then it would give us an error, a warning saying that value was not used. You can ignore that if you want, or you can take out the initialization. I just kind of like initializing everything, but the Java NetBeans disagrees with that. So you can initialize things when you create the variable, or you can assign a value later on after you create the variable. Both works. Numeric data types, int and long. Ints are four byte values. Longs are eight byte values. And we've already talked about, you know, how the number of bits increase, you know. Four bits, that fourth bit is worth an eight. Eight bits, that eighth bit is equal to 128. It keeps doubling. And so the maximum value of a four byte value is two billion. And the maximum value of an eight byte value is a huge number that I have no idea. What do you know? It's 9 to the power of 18. So to declare an integer, you just give the variable name preceded by the type. To declare a long, which means long integer, use the data type followed by the variable name. Recommendation. Use smaller types for variables that will never need to hold larger values. Okay, so a student ID. You'll probably never have a student ID that's greater than 2 billion. So why not store it in an int? On the other hand, the public debt, I mean the national debt, is in the trillions. So it would not fit into an int. So we would use a long for it. Actually, since it's a numeric value with a fractional component like point whatever, I would not store it in an int at all. Now don't take that too far and think, okay, wow, an int is too large to hold this value because I'm just storing somebody's age and I need to find a data type that is, you know, only goes up to a 100 or something like that. And you could. You could find a data type that only supported values between 0 and 255. You would be using a byte and, tre or, no, excuse me, a character and tricking it into being treated like, anyways, don't worry about maximizing your memory usage by choosing by going to great lengths to choose long uh, the correct data types. The rule of thumb should just always be use ints unless you need a larger type. And for floating points, it should be use doubles, just period. Don't even bother with the smaller floating point type, which is flow. Just use doubles, period, because that's the default data type in Java. The two default data types are ints and then doubles. And there's a smaller version of the double called a float, but it's not the default data type Doubles work just as fast as floats. There's no reason to use them. There's no reason to use floats. So we have the two data types. The float is the four byte data type. The double is the eight byte data type. So double use 64 bits, which can hold astronomically larger values and more precise values. The mantissa, you know, the number of digits before the exponent. You have like 16 places of decimal accuracy rather than eight. So just use doubles because they're more precise. So recommendation. You should normally declare your floating point variables with the double type. They are more precise. In particular, don't use float variables when there are calculations involving money or scientific measurements. You want the most precise values possible. Here's the range of values for a float. 3 times 10 to the 38. Right, 3 followed by 38 zeros. If it's a double, it's 3 followed by 308 zeros. You can only rely on 6 significant digits in a float, but you can rely on 15 significant digits for a double. So, just use a double as a matter of course. I haven't gotten very many notes in here. Use ints unless you need a larger data type. to hold a value of more than 2 billion. Use 
use doubles rather than floats as a matter of course because doubles are so much more precise. Fifteen digits of accuracy as opposed to six. So use ints unless you need a larger data type, in which case you'd use long. Could you just decide I'm going to use long for every integer? Yeah, but people will look at you oddly and wonder why you're using an, a long to store somebody's age when you're quite sure that they're not going to be, you know, three followed by 38 zeros years old. That'd be pretty weird. So you can assign an integer into a floating point variable. That's fine. This is a less accurate data type because it doesn't contain decimal points. Floating points are more accurate. That's fine. No data will get lost when you turn 1,000 into a, a float or a double. But on the other hand, if you try to store a float into an int, it'll generate a compilation error. And for those of y'all who just took C++, that was not the case. It would do it, but it would just drop the 0.7 without telling you. And if you took Python, then it would actually change the data type as you put the value in it. This language is very particular. Once you declare a variable as an int, that's all you can store in it. Now, if you want to convert it to an int, you can. Just like in Java, uh, Python, you did that. Well, that's not how you do it in this language. You do this. That takes this number and converts it into the correct format. It's called casting. Like you create a cast and then you pour metal into it and that metal gets formed into the shape of the cast. Well, we're taking these bits and we're forming them into the shape of an int. Constants. These are literals, literal constants. These are also known as unnamed constants. They don't have names. They're not assigned into a variable. The default type for an integer constant is int, not a long. So if you need to use a literal that's too big to fit into an int, you have to tell the compiler. So for example, in my text pad file, if I wanted to create a long, long, big num, and I wanted to store a trillion in it, well, a trillion has how many zeros after it? 12? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's going to be a compilation error because all literals, all unnamed numeric values without a decimal point are assumed to be ints. An int cannot be that large. An int can only be up to like 2 billion, a little bit more than 2 billion. So when I compile it, it's going to give me an error. It says this integer number is too large. And so I go, I know it is. I really want you to use it, though. So you use an L to force this literal to be treated as a long. Now, what if it was a double? Does it assume that floating point numbers are floats? No, the default data type for floating point literals is double. So when I want to do something like that, Although that's way too precise for a float, it's perfect for a double. I'm not going to get any syntax errors. If I wanted to force it to be treated as a float for some reason, if despite all my advice and the advice of the book, you made this a float, then you would need to put an F here. But we're not going to do that. You're always going to use doubles. So the default type for a floating point constant, a floating point literal, is double. Now you can name your constants if you want. You can store the value. For example, if you want to, you could say double pi is equal to 3.14159. And then if you want to declare it a constant, here's the word you don't use, const. You saw that in, in C++. Instead, you use the word final. 
the Java developers had to be different, come up with a different keyword. Final means that that's its final value. It cannot change. So this is what's known as a named constant. PI is a variable that's equal to that, and you can't change it later in your code. If you do this, I'm going to decide that pi is equal to 4 in my little universe. It won't compile. It says cannot, oh, here I made it uppercase and here I made a lowercase. Why did you make that variable uppercase? I thought you said to use lowercase letters for variables. I did. Here we go. Cannot assign a value to final variable pi. In other words, pi is a constant in this case. It was declared as final. We cannot change its value once a value has been assigned to it. The reason I made this uppercase is because another naming convention is that you make your constants uppercase. Just a naming convention. You don't have to. And that you use underscores in their names. Like if you wanted to, if you wanted to make an, a value called max value, you'd use an underscore in all caps. Like that. Final int max value is equal to 100. For whatever purposes that would be. That's a common naming convention. I believe it's one that the book follows as well. So let's make some notes. Name your classes with an initial cap. Name your variables with lowercase, camel case. Exception, if it's a final, a const, use all caps. I'm not going to specify the underscore business because I like underscores in my variable names too when I'm feeling like it. So this code generates compilation errors. Why? Somebody tell me why that might be an error. Because this is a double, this is a float, and the compiler realizes that it's afraid that we might lose some data. Now in this case we wouldn't. 2.3 is small enough to fit comfortably into a float. But the compiler doesn't care because the compiler doesn't know what that value is. It just knows that it's a double. And so it says you could have data loss. I'm not going to let you. If you wanted to fix that, you could do that. You could tell it to convert it to a float or you could just use the f suffix just like you use an l. That would compile. Same error here. We have a floating point variable, but we're trying to assign a literal here. That literal is a double unless we do that. Easiest way to fix that, just don't use floats. Use doubles. So that's the solution. I'll use doubles rather than floats, or to float, to force a floating point constant to be float, use an f suffix. So constants can be specified into two categories, hard-coded constants and named constants. Now, I've been calling them literals. Another textbook I've been teaching from uses the term literal, and that's a that's well-established naming convention. But other people call them hard-coded constants. There's stuff that's literally coded into your code. Right, this number here is literally coded into my code. It's an unnamed constant. It's a hard-coded constant. A hard-coded constant is an explicitly specified value. For example, in this assignment statement, that is a hard-coded constant. Now, honestly, I've forgotten you could use underscores to separate numbers like that. And I'm curious if that even works. Surely it does, or the book wouldn't testify to that effect. Sorry, I need to fix that. I know that doesn't work. Can we do that? Can we say big num is equal to 1 underscore 2, 3, 4 underscore 4, 5, 6 underscore... 7, 8, 9, underscore 10, 11, 12, L to force it to be a long. External tool compile. Yeah, that works. What do you know? What if you get all funky with it? Huh. 
everybody know? Yeah, their scores are displaced. I mean, they're, they're nothing. They're ignored. Pardon? Yeah, apparently they're ignored. I had forgotten that. That's not going to work in other languages. I wouldn't take that to the bank. But yeah, you can do it. You, you can use those to break up, you know, your numbers into groups of three. It does make them easier to understand. Why do you do that? Because this is not allowed. You cannot put commas in your numbers, in your literals like that. Too bad. Wish you could. But the reason why is that commas have a very specific meaning. They're used to separate arguments in a function call, in a method call. And so it wouldn't know the difference between. So they let you use underscores instead. Neato. So here's a named constant. Speed of light is equal to 299 underscore 792 underscore 458.0 meters per second. Why did they put the point zero there? Because that forces it to be a double. Otherwise, it would be treated as though it were an, an int. So that's the easiest way to force a literal to be treated as a double. It's just attack on point zero. And this number is not too large to be put into an int. 299 million is not over that 2 billion limit. So that would actually work. But if we had more digits of accuracy in it, it would be a problem. So the final modifier tells the compiler to generate an error if your program ever tries to change the final variable at a later time. Now it's not like it makes the code more safe, less, you know, that that data is somehow safe from hacking or something like that because you made it a const because you put the word final in front of the variable declaration. It just tells the compiler not to let you make the mistake of changing it. Does that make sense? Just like the private keyword, which you will hit later, you know, it makes that data private. Does that mean that, ooh, that data is really safe and secure, you know, no hacker will ever be able to... No, all it means is something to the compiler. It doesn't prevent somebody from editing your code with a hex editor, like hexed.it, or some from some memory injection virus from changing data in your programs. It just is something to help the compiler generate the code and to stop you from making programming mistakes, changing a value of a constant when you didn't mean to. So the standard coding convention suggests that you cap capitalize all letters, all characters in a name constant that you use underscores. That's, that's real common, not just in Java. Two main benefits of using name consonants. Leads to code that's more understandable. If everywhere in my code I just had this number repeated over and over and over, my eyes would cross when I was looking at the code and I might not know what that number was. Might figure it out, but I might not. And what if I mistyped it occasionally, right? That's a long number. What if one time I typed it like that? Well, then our moon lander is going to, you know, hit the planet or whatever rather than, you know, fly over it successfully because we, we're off by a magnitude of 10 there. So store your literals, your hard-coded values, in named constants unless the, unless the meaning of it is absolutely trivial. And what do I mean by that? Like if you're just doubling a number and you're going to multiply it by 2 because you want to double it as part of a formula. You don't have to define 2 as a named constant and then use that everywhere. So for mathematical formulas, you know, for simple ratios, you don't necessarily have to do that. But for values like that, whether it's a tax rate, you know, or some interest rate calculation, you might define it as a constant. At least store it in a variable. A magic number is one that just appears in the middle of the code and you don't know what it means. It, that's, you know, a slang term. But if I did propagation delay is equal to cable length divided by, and I had this right here, and I was looking at 5,000 lines of code, you're not going to let me paste that there? And this was, you know, embedded in the middle of a function way, way, way down. And I didn't know what that was. I wouldn't know where that number came from. What in the world is that? But if it's called speed of light, it makes instant sense to me. It may not be a correct formula, but at least it makes sense to me. I understand what it's trying to do. So using name constants leads to code that is more understandable. 
the easier your code is to read, the more likely that somebody else who comes along or you, when you work on it in the future, will be able to make good changes to it. If it's hard to read, then whoever works on it after you is probably going to mess it up, or you will mess it up. If a programmer ever needs to change a named constant's value, the change is easy. You just name it one place. If I didn't use a named constant for the speed of light, then I may have made a, then I would have that number repeated over and over in my code, and I might have a typo in it. So, arithmetic operators. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. We know what those are. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because we have a homework assignment coming up. You have your addition operators. You have addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and then you also have modulus. Notice that there's no floor division and there's no exponent operator. If you want to do this, x is equal to x plus 10, you can short that to x plus equals 10. Those two things do the same thing. y is equal to y minus 2, you can do y minus equals 2. z is equal to z times 3, you can do z times equals 3. a is equal to a divided by 2, you can do a divided by equal 2. Now, if you're adding or subtracting 1, you could do x equals x plus 1, you could do x plus equals 1, or the special increment operator, x plus plus. If you're doing subtraction, y is equal to y minus 1, you can do y minus equals 1, or you can do y minus minus. That's new to your Python programmers didn't support that for some reason. This is called the increment operator. That's called the decrement operator. These are called compound operators because they do two things. They do the addition and they do the assignment. Or they do the subtraction and they do the assignment. So I'm going to go back into our text pad. I'm going to declare a number and then I'm going to use some of those values on it. int my num is equal to 100. So my num plus plus, that's going to change it to be 101. My num plus equals 50. Now it's going to be 151. My num times equals 2. My num minus equals 50. And then a num divided by equals 3. Now I'm going to print the result. System.out.println. Just see what the result is. num equals, end quote, comma. Nope, not comma. In this language, we have to concatenate everything. Plus num. And actually, I want to see those values change. So I'm going to copy and paste that so that it happens after every single operation. So I'm just going to paste it like four times. Once, twice, three times, four times. Then I'm going to pad it out a little bit with a white space to make it easier to see. syntax errors going after all these changes. Tool completed successfully. Okay, I'm going to run it. And there we go. Right, the first one added 1 to it, plus plus added 1 to it, and then plus equals added 50, and then times equals 2, multiplied it by 2, and minus equals 50, subtracted 50 from that, and divided by 3, well, 252 divided by 3 rounded down is 84. So those are the compound assignment operators. Now, why did I leap ahead and show you that? Because we have a homework assignment based on that. Yep, compound assignment operator. It's in the chapter, so you can hit it. Let's go look at the homework.
Ludwig or something. Oh, I probably should have talked about it. All right, well, this is the homework based on the compound operators. If I need to delay the uh, menu-driven program, I will. All right, so write a program that asks the user for the value of, that should be x, and another int y. What's the first thing we're going to do? Add y to x, store the result into x. So it would be x equals x plus y, but instead we're going to use plus equals. And then print that y was added to x and display the new value of x. Multiply x by y, storing into x using star equal, and then print the result. Divide x by y and store into x using divide equal. And then subtract y from x and store into x using minus equals. Then increment x using plus plus, decrement x using minus minus, and to my eyes, the initial value and the final value should be the same because we added something to it, we multiplied, we divided, we subtracted, right, da, 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 and then we incremented it, and then we decremented it. So pretty much I think that the final result will be to whatever the user typed in, the last message. So that one should be pretty easy. All you have to do is remember what we did here, right? Except instead of doing plus equals 50, you'll be doing x plus equals y, right? And instead of doing times, e that you know, you'd be doing x times equals y, and so on. x minus equals y, x divided by equals y. All right, so that menu homework, have we really not talked about it yet? Let's go look. Loops. Oh, wait, that's in class stuff. Menu-based programs, September 10. Yeah, that looks like it's due next Monday. Looks like I assume that we wouldn't have covered the knowledge already. Take a peek at it. All right. It was supposed to be a follow-up to the uh, loop program where you asked the user what they were supposed to do, and then you would do that. And we haven't written an example of a, of a menu-based program, or did we already? Feel free to say we haven't written a menu-based program yet. Okay, we haven't written a menu-based program. We'll cover that on Thursday, and then we'll extend the due date of this homework to match. But all it's supposed to do is ask the user from the prior assignment, you were writing loops that counted up and counted down and stuff like that. Instead, you're going to let the user pick which one they want to do. And then you'll ask, you know, what do you want to count up to? Yep, absolutely. That needs to be a four. So I'm going to download it and edit it while we're talking about it. So the due date for homework six is actually going to be before homework five just because I know that we know how to do homework six. But if that turns out not to be the case, you know, half the class hasn't got it turned in. I'll give you all an extra couple of days. All right, need to upload that. All right, if we had already talked about writing menu-based programs, does this assignment make sense? But we'll cover it again. We'll cover it on Thursday. It's not due. It's not due next Monday. It'll be due Wednesday. We good on that? Okay. Okay, cool. And we're also good on the other one. We're pretty clear on what the incrementing and the decrementing and stuff like that does. We can cover that again as well on Thursday because we haven't had the slide over it yet. All right. Why don't we stop the recording? Are there any questions? Did anybody get syntax errors that you didn't flag me down and wish that I'd helped with?